Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Quadrant Chamber's annual Energy Disputes event. Now I'm proud to say in its fifth year. Our host this year is Stevenson Harwood, and we're very grateful to it for allowing us to use this splendid space and for joining us uh, in hosting the reception which follows the seminar at the end of the evening. Our special thanks to Peter Bennett for organising all this. Thanks very much, Peter. The title of this year's event is Current Challenges and Risks for Oil and Gas. You will be glad, I hope, to hear that tonight's event is a 100% Brexit-free space. <laughs> in fact, not quite 100% for reasons I'll come back to in a moment. And indeed, many acceptances of invitations were on condition that no Brexit topic will be covered this evening. Quadrant recently held an international arbitration panel, one of our uh, many panels, in February, and we gave it the title, What on Earth Happens Next? Uh, foreseeing the Impact of Brexit. We thought that was a rather dramatic title, but uh, attention-grabbing, but actually, who could have guessed? So no Brexit tonight, but if during any of the talks there should be some dramatic news, the government falls, or there's a vote of no confidence, I will interrupt the speaker, unless it's really very interesting, and let you know. So tonight's menu is a non-Brexit but a varied one. We range from force majeure or not force majeure in the Ghanaian Jubilee and TEN fields to the ever-changing kaleidoscopic world of sanctions, from the effects of private equity investors in North Sea contracts, good thing or bad thing, to the challenges of contractual notification regimes, and we confront the spectre of climate change litigation. And we're lucky to have five excellent and highly experienced speakers to guide us through these thorny and controversial topics. By popular request, we're going to follow a slightly different format this evening. I will introduce each speaker and their talk in turn, and we'll pause at the end of each talk to take any burning questions which people have. Apparently people say, I don't like questions being put off at the end. I can't ask my burning question before I have to leave and catch my train. So make sure you ask lots of burning questions. But we will have a question and answer session at the end uh, and a debate uh, in the usual way. So we start first with the future and the challenges of climate change which lie ahead for the oil and gas majors and other producers who have to grapple with demand for energy and demand for fewer emissions all at the same time. And who also have to face a new world, a new world in which litigation arising out of climate change and its actual or perceived causes is increasingly becoming the new reality with complex multi-jurisdictional aspects. It's a whole new world, a long way from traditional contract-based risk management and litigation. Those are difficult problems being addressed by senior counsel in the big oil and gas majors. And we're very lucky to have as our first speaker, Sarah Roach from BP, to peer into that future for us. Sarah is a very well-known and well-respected figure in the industry, senior counsel in BP's London team, astonishingly efficient at six members only, handling a vast range of high-value disputes, except for the US. And Sarah will be looking into the future for us. Sarah. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I am going to use my 12 minutes, which I've got, to talk about two topics. The first topic is something that is very close to the hearts of the execs at BP, um, and that's the dual challenge, and of course that's filtered down through the whole company. And the second topic is something that we in the BP disputes team are, of course, keeping a an eye on, which is the topic of um, climate change litigation. So <clears throat> the dual challenge, what is it? For this we need to go back to the Paris Accord 2015 um, and the, um, the goal set by the Paris Accord, which was to keep the increase in the global temperatures, the average global temperatures, to well below 2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. So a bit of a mouthful. But um, you've got on this one hand the Paris goals to keep a cap on global temperature rise. And on the other hand, you've got the economic reports going out for the next 20 years showing that there's going to be a 30% rise in um, global requirement for energy in the next 20 years. 
So that is the dual challenge. It's the need to produce more energy to satisfy this massive increase, really, in global demand, but to do that with fewer emissions. So um, what is BP doing um, in this space to help advance um, this goal? We've got our Reduce, Improve, Create framework. Um, so we're seeking to reduce emissions in our own uh, operations. Our target is for, for net growth, net um, growth in our, in our um, emissions from 2015 going out to 2025, in spite of having to produce obviously more energy. And the way we're going to um, attempt to do this, of course, is to um, cut down on carbon emissions in our own operations, and also, really importantly, to target methane emissions. Uh, methane, as you probably know, as a greenhouse gas, is more potent than um, carbon. And so we've really got to keep a cap on methane emissions as far as we possibly can. The second string is to improve products, um, uh, which is going to be more investment, really, in the gas portfolio. Natural gas is the partner, I think, really, for renewables going forward in the energy transition. Um, and it's very important, and we are increasing the portfolio of gas. Um, the downside, obviously, to gas is, is the methane, um, which we're targeting, as I've said. Um, in addition to that, we're developing more efficient lower carbon fuels so that the end users, their carbon footprint is, is less. Uh, and also looking at carbon offers such as carbon capture, um, use and storage, which is a technology that's um, having a lot of investment put into it at the moment. Uh, and finally, creating a low carbon business. We have always had, for a long time now, um, a big biofuels business in Brazil. Uh, and we are um, investing in that more. We are going back, we're back in solar. We're um, partnering with LightSource, which is I think the biggest solar provider in Europe. Um, and we are um, increasing the, the wind energy. I think we're one of the biggest um, providers of wind energy in the US. So we're expanding our own renewables and also investing in new enterprises um, and new businesses. Uh, creating new products that will have a, a, a lower carbon footprint than traditional products. So that's um, our framework and our goal. How are we going to be held accountable to it for any of this? Uh, uh, all corporates, of course, have come under a lot of pressure recently uh, over the last few years um, from shareholders, from activists and from employees, I think, um, to, to be more transparent in your reporting to what you're doing in relation to climate change, and BP's no exception. Um, so uh, one of the institutional investor groups, Climate Action 100, have, in, have proposed a resolution to be put to the BP AGM next month um, for BP to broaden its corporate reporting to show how it is being consistent with the Paris goals. Uh, and this uh, proposed resolution has got the backing of the BP executive board, so hopefully um, next month it will be adopted and uh, it will lead to slightly more transparent reporting which has got to be good for, for everybody involved. Um, so that in a really small nutshell is uh, the dual challenge. Moving on to climate change litigation. Um, in the disputes team we're obviously keen to keep an eye on this because it's a growing area of law that we're very interested in. Um, so far, there's been, I think, over a thousand climate change related cases, mostly since 2015, but some obviously prior to that. Mostly, it seems that, that governments and states are the main defendants, but corporates are increasingly being brought in to the mix. Um, one of the strings of um, claims that we are interested in, in watching uh, at BP is the, the one that sort of began with the Agenda Foundation case which is a bit of a beacon, I think, in climate change litigation circles, where the Agenda Foundation and I think about 900 um, citizens, Dutch citizens, brought a claim against the Dutch state, trying to get it to Im impose more stringent climate change litigation legislation. Um, and the claimants won at first instance. The state appealed on a number of points, 
uh, and the appeal decision came out in October of last year and the state lost on I think every point pretty much. Uh, and the issue that interested us was the fact that the court found that the state owed a duty of care to its citizens under Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So that's the, the right to life <coughs> and the right to a private life. So the state held a duty of care under those, those provisions of the Human Rights Treaty to its citizens to reduce carbon emissions by 25% by 2020. Now that, you know, is quite a strong duty of care. And one of the, uh, one of the arguments that the state brought um, was that you, you can't make this sort of order court, you cannot legislate, you can't put yourselves in the place of the legislature. And the court said, well, we're not doing that. All we're doing is making an order as to your, what your duties are within that order. <coughs> you have got complete discretion how you, how you uh, reach the goals. You can make whatever legislation you want. Uh, and likewise with causation, um, the court said causation in a, in a case like this is really not important. What was being sought was an order, it wasn't damages. Damages, obviously, you know, causation is more important, said the court. And so we're, we're watching this, um, this case and the pipeline that's coming through now in the European courts <coughs> to see whether the same sort of um, judgment is going to come out uh, on, on other cases that are coming through. And we're looking at the, the People's Climate Ch case in the EU, uh, which has similar, not, not identical by any means, but similar sorts of claims are being made uh, to the European General Court. And uh, I think pleadings have closed in that one, and we're waiting for the judgment. Um, and then there was one commenced in Germany um, in October and then another one in France only last month. So we're looking at this pipeline of cases just to see whether other courts are going to follow the same route, really, as um, the Dutch courts. You don't have to go to court if you have got a grievance. Um, I think we might all have heard of the, the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines Inquiry, uh, which involved 47 corporates, all of whom declined to take part because of lack of jurisdiction, BP being one of those corporates. But nevertheless, the inquiry went ahead and uh, the report and findings, I think, is due out this June. So again, that's one to, to look out for. Um, and then I've put this next one on just because it was interesting. It's um, Dutch NGOs using the OECD guidelines and the complaints procedure under that to bring a claim against the corporate, against the bank. Um, for alleged breaches um, of the guidelines <coughs> in the way it's reporting climate change issues. So both its own carbon footprint and also how it reports on um, projects that it invests in and the climate uh, effects of, that, of those projects. So again, it's, it's one I think that is just an interesting one to watch. And then finally, um, claims against corporates. I've divided these into two types. Um, there's the, the typical sort of class action claim brought in the US uh, by shareholders um, alleging failure to disclose, resulting in share price going down and damages being owed. Um, we, BP, were not involved in that sort of claim in the US. What we are involved in is this second group, claims against oil and gas majors. Um, these, these claims are being brought by cities and counties in the US um, for tort, um, alleged tort um, claims. So it's nuisance claims and negligence claims, a bit of statutory duty and a bit of statutory liability as well. Um, BP is involved in 13 of these claims out in the US. You've got a set of claims brought by um, New York City and you've got a set of claims brought by cities and counties in California. All of the cases, as I understand it, are on appeal at the moment. You've got the New York cases going to the Second Circuit and the, the um, Californian cases going to the Ninth Circuit. So obviously there's a chance there of conflicting judgments, parallel proceedings. Who knows? And uh, I would imagine, because it is such an important topic, that any, whoever loses will go to the Supreme Court on this in the US. Um, but it seems to me that what 
the issue that's being appealed is the issue of jurisdiction. In the States, it, it, it appears that to be the general consensus that the state courts are not the right place to bring these sorts of claims because what they don't want is this scattergun approach, different states taking different um, routes and coming to different judgments. Federal courts, though, have said that they don't have jurisdiction to decide this sort of dispute because their jurisdiction is ousted by statute. So, um, again, for us in the UK, it's very much a watch this space area to see you know, where that goes. Uh, our colleagues, BP colleagues in um, the US are dealing with them. But to see where it goes and also see whether anything similar is coming over uh, to us in, in Europe. So that um, is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. A feature of the past few years has been the divestment by the majors of their holdings in North Sea oil and gas and their replacement with a whole new breed of private equity investor. What the Financial Times called this year the changing of the guard, rather impressive. Wood Mackenzie, in a report in January, predicted another $13 billion of private equity investment in North Sea oil and gas in the next few years. The first example of which may be the possible uh, divestment by Total, to completely new boys on the block, Albion Energy and First Alpha Energy, of 1.3 billion worth of holdings in the North Sea. So is this a good development, a bad development, or a bit of both? One view is that, I quote, the squeezing of the pips in a mature basin by aggressive new players, as some see it. And that was the theme in a recent four-week trial which I did with Henry Ellis of Quadrant Chambers, who's here this evening, representing Teesside Gas in a claim against CATS, the Central Area Transmission System, which was sold by BP to Antin, or Hongtown Capital, in 2016. Judgment is awaited. Or is it, as Alan Curran of Verus Petroleum, which has snapped up a host of fields, said recently in an interview to Energy Voice, we are a force for good. Well, tonight's speaker, Elizabeth Sullivan, is going to address that question. Elizabeth has a long track record in uh, energy matters, formerly with Herbert Smith Freehills, then company secretary and legal manager with Perenco, and now uh, senior legal counsel with Centrica since 2018. And she has a very immediate experience of the private equity effect. I hope we'll be a bit sensitive about who our audience is. You're going to ask that, I think. And the operator's perspective of working with private equity in oil and gas. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I like the introduction, and I will start off by just asking, is there anyone here who's happy to admit that they're in private equity or that they're associated in some way with private equity? Or we all just prefer to stay quiet? Okay, well, that, right, will, we'll slightly, like now. Yeah, that will slightly inform the, the, the colour of this talk. Um, I should say, uh, as a related point, that the views that I express are purely expressed in my own capacity. They don't represent those of Centrico. So as um, Simon has very um, ably uh, uh, introduced the topic, the North Sea, which I'm going to focus on, um, has seen a, a, a real surge of uh, new investment in the last um, decade um, from private equity-backed uh, players um, and, and also from some other new players which aren't, strictly speaking, private equity-backed, but they, um, the, the sort of the Perencos and the Ineos types who are uh, privately owned by, um, by, by families or individuals. And um, <clears throat> this has, you know, markedly changed, uh, changed the North Sea. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to start off by giving, in 12 minutes, a very brief history um, uh, and sort of introduction to this. Um, you know, and I don't think anyone uh, will be very surprised when I say I think that the private equity uh, sort of change came about um, naturally following the, um, the financial crash in 2008 and then the oil price crash in 2014. As the oil majors started to exit the basin looking for lower cost opportunities elsewhere um, or to restructure their portfolios, um, other, this sort of created a vacuum which in the absence of debt finance was, um, there was an opportunity for those with coming with a private equity background to fill it. 
Uh, nothing surprising there, I don't think, um, in terms of a list of characters. It's like a sort of Oscar speech. I don't want to miss anyone out, and apologies if I do. But obviously, there's the you know the the, the sort of the larger uh, players. The the FT article that um, that Simon quoted. I don't know if he actually just saw the headline. Uh, on the sheet of paper that I had on my desk, actually, because I have it here. But there's a very helpful summary in the FT in um, January of this year, setting out the, the sort of the big players and giving some interesting numbers. They they think that over the last uh, two years, they think there'll be there's been 12 billion dollars investment, um, with a further I don't know where they get these numbers from a further 13 billion dollar investment to come. Um, so obviously, you know, quite substantial numbers. And people that, you know, be familiar to this audience, Chrysler, Neptune, Sika Point, uh, Kerrigan, um, you know, I think roughly sort of in size order their first alpha. Uh, is smaller companies, Varus was uh, mentioned, Zeno Park Mead. Um, you know, they're all very much on the scene now in the North Sea in one capacity or another. There's also the, that brand, uh, branch of um, private equity, which is focusing on the um, oil and gas infrastructure assets. So the former companies I mentioned are operating or have non-operated interests in the North Sea. Companies like CATS, now called Kellis, which I understand is a name of a Scottish wild cat. Um, they uh, they specialise in, in infrastructure, oil and gas. And this gives me the opportunity to raise that rather grand, grand expression um, tax arbitrage, which I think always sounds super. Um, and I think I'm sure people uh, here will be aware that uh, if you are not an upstream EMP oil and gas company, then you're able to, um, you're able to deploy a lower tax rate than, um, uh, th than those upstream players. So there is a, an arbitrage there where people view things like the CATS pipeline um, the Easington uh, well, the gas terminals, um, various infrastructure assets, um, and they, they, they're able to get a sort of a, a greater margin of return on those than the upstream companies. And you know, commercially, what's in it for the private for private equity? Well, um, you know, I think they see an opportunity. Uh, perhaps they haven't yet been broken down by the realities and the brutalities of working in the North Sea. But they come in, you know, uh, bright as day, and they, you know, and they see they see an opportunity. And not don't let me put you off. Um, companies like um, Perenka that I used to work for um, pride themselves on being a lower cost operator. So they don't have an inflated um, staff. They don't have uh, gold plating. They sort of do things quick and easily and simply, and they um, they try to make more money out of it. Um, and you know, there have been various tax and regulatory changes. Uh, over the last few years to try and encourage uh, private equity and um, I think one of the changes that has helped has been the ability to transfer tax histories from a disposing company to a new company so that when you come to offset your decommissioning costs at the end of life you have something to offset that against. Um, and this, uh, those, those regulatory and tax changes um, have, uh, you know, I think also been informed by the, the, the position of the Oil and Gas Authority, which is, um, I, I understand, broadly supportive of uh, private <coughs> equity and, you know, is, is doing it what it can to encourage new entrants in the North Sea, uh, subject, of course, to those new entrants being able to demonstrate that they have the financial and technical capability necessary to, to deliver. However, this is not a legal talk uh, sorry, it is a legal talk. <laughs> I forgot myself for a moment. I thought I was a private equity investor, and actually I'm a lonely lawyer. Although now that I understand more about private equity, I rather wish I'd gone into that after I left university, but there we have it. Um, so what do, we, what do we understand about um, the legal impact of working with private equity? Well, I think what you can see is that you have to be able to embrace novel structures. Um, which is good, you know, it, it means that we're sort of not stuck in the 1970s doing uh, deals with just other oil majors, but we have to embrace change. And change, I think, in the context of private equity, from my vantage point, means uh, you have to accept that there will be things like the division between infrastructure and uh, oil and gas upstream assets. And I've just worked with Centrica on the toll mount deal where we tied in a toll mount gas field in the southern North Sea into the Easington terminal. And the structure that was used there was a novel structure. In fact, it won the, uh, the MER UK, the Maximising Economic Recovery uh, UK Award in, the, in Aberdeen, in the Oil and Gas UK Awards. 
um, for its novelty. Um, there the infrastructure assets are owned by Katz, or Kellis now, and the upstream assets are owned by Premier and Dana. Um, and, you know, we also see the novel structures in terms of operators are coming in, backed by private equity. They don't have a long history of operating, so to demonstrate that they have the technical capability, they will subcontract um, what's known as the duty holdership of, of an oil and gas field to a third party, a, a wood group or a Petrofac or someone like that. And there are many supply chain companies around that are very willing to take on that role for a fee. Um, and what else do we see in terms of the legal impact? Well, I, was, I would say that there is a departure from traditional risk allocation in oil and gas contracts. The, um, again, the sort of 1970s, and I suddenly have in mind everyone with sort of flared trousers, having a long lunch, uh, <laughs> SOBP shell, E and I sitting around a table, they all agree on capped liability and they let the secretary sort of type it up, you know, after, uh, after, after lunch. And it, I'm sure it was all, you know, lots of fun back then. Um, and I suppose actually, I think in summary, you could say with private equity on board now, everything is all rather sort of slightly less fun. Um, and people aren't prepared to take uh, uncapped liabilities. In fact, you know, they, they definitely want to cap their liabilities because um, I think the way to understand this is that people are coming in not with a sort of unlimited deep pockets, you know, oil and gas assets across the world in, you know, multiple jurisdictions. They're not only in oil and gas. These people are coming in. They have a fixed sum of money. they have um, competing with, uh, you know, investments in other markets. They've got to deliver a certain re uh, rate of return. And, you know, if they, the, the sort of concept of an uncapped liability is just completely abhorrent to them. Um, as I say, I'm not in private equity, otherwise I might be able to afford myself to buy a quarter of a oil and gas field in the North Sea. But I am thinking about buying a fraction of a yacht in the Solent currently. And I think that sort of, um, I feel that you come with that with the same mindset. The upfront cost appears to be relatively low. You can buy a quarter of a yacht in the Solent for £10,000 plus £2,000 marina fees. But I'm not going to go in wanting to think that actually in sort of six months' time I'm going to have to replace the mast and that's going to cost, you know, £100,000 because I haven't got it uh, yet. Um, and, I <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, this is how you have to understand where private equity are coming from. And, you know, maybe that's not such an unreasonable approach. Maybe in time we're going to think not so strange that people want to come in and cap their liability but more that the sort of the majors, uh, you know, used to be able to sit around the table and accept uncapped liability on a self-insuring basis, given what we know now about the risks of oil and gas. And maybe that's the point, maybe at the time they didn't understand what the risks really were. Um, what else do we see? Challenging the status quo. So um, not only are private equity people coming in and they're saying, well, hang on, you've got this big project. In 10 years' time, you think you're going to make a lot of money but actually, can you please do that in two years' time? And rather than spending $2 billion, would you be able to do it for one? Um, so the, there are these type of pressures, obviously not a legal point. A legal point, I would say, is that you need to be very careful when private equity are coming in, because I think they will be looking through those 1970s long lunch secretary typed up contracts to see precisely whether there are, and let me use the expression again, any arbitrage, any opportunity to, uh, to, to, to game them and to, get a, to reopen them. To, to get uh, added value, which they can take back to their shareholders and be fruitfully rewarded for, no doubt. And I suppose that's the point that, um, as an uh, operator, and it actually it's a little unfair to say operator because the private equity people are now operating themselves, but as someone uh, not backed by private equity, um, a more traditional uh, uh, existing entrant, What's, what is the challenge in, in responding to this? How do you respond to this? And I would say, you know, firstly, look at the upside. People are coming in with money to spend um, at a time when many other people are exiting the basin. So, you know, that's fantastic. And the Tolmad deal I mentioned, that has extended the life of the Easington gas terminal. It's up in Hull. I don't expect many of you will have visited it. But the people there have now have jobs, um, you know, for the next decade or two, you know, which they wouldn't have had otherwise. And this is obviously a fantastic thing. And, you know, in terms of the risks, we talked about uh, the fact that private equity want to cap their risks. What does that mean for everyone else around the table? Well, necessarily, it means that you're taking on more risks as a, as a result of 
then wanting to cap their risk. And this leads me to uh, my second favourite expression in my lecture, which is that some people would think that everyone coming in around the table need to have skin in the game. Now, I've never actually understood the etymology of that expression, skin in the game, and I, on reflection, I think it's probably best not to ask in the Me Too era, so I'll just... <laughs> perhaps. I would say it's usually... Uh, the, the preceding remark is usually, I've been in the oil and gas industry for 40 years, and you know, in order to be here, you used to have skin in the game, and then someone throws their toys out of the pram. But I think what they mean is that um, if you want to sit in a, a joint operating agreement and you want to have shared liability on a joint several basis, there, there is some law in this talk, then you should be doing that on an, on an uncapped liability basis. Everyone should come in as an, equal, uh, as an equal player. And this is the challenge with private equity. And the concern as, the, as a legal counsel representing a company where you're dealing with novel structures you're separating infrastructure and upstream assets. You're agreeing to, to cap liabilities. Is you know when when this uh, you know, when the cards fall on this, how is it going to land uh, for us? And uh, you know hopefully the, the contract that I've just put in place will stand the test of time. Uh, and if not, then you'll find me on my yacht in the Solent. <laughs> um, and what what else do we say? And I'm conscious. I don't know if I'm approaching my 12 minutes. I feel like I maybe I have. You have 30 seconds left. 30 seconds left. Okay, well, 30 Treat seconds. Treat yourself. 30 seconds left. Let me say, um, uh, some people will try and block private private equity backed uh, people com coming in by saying they don't have the financial and the technical capability. And I think if if you try that hard that card to uh, to to um, too much, then I think the oil and gas authority will be very unimpressed with you and will start saying things like. Mo UK and uh, and various other things and of course uh, these obligations uh, to withhold consent are always done on a reasonable basis and you know not incurring unnecessary delay so it, you know it is difficult um, it is difficult but then we have seen what happens when you have multiple contractors that you know everything has been delegated to uh, you know in various various uh, incidents you know Deepwater Horizon of course. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what, how it's going to pan out with these invest these operators who have uh, private equity and are um, outsourcing all the technical parts. I think time will tell on that. Um, and finally, my final point, I would say, um, as someone bringing in private equity, working with new entrants, I think you know you just want to have your um, ducks in a row. Really, you want to be looking, shaking out those contracts from the 1970s, just thinking, are they fit for purpose? No one, I don't think, around this table was quite imagining that in 40, 50 years' time, you know, someone from a sort of private equity angle was going to be scrutinising them, looking for holes. So this might be a good opportunity for you to do just that before, uh, before you, you sort of come, up, come across a challenge and have to instruct Simon Rainey to defend you. <laughs> Although probably Simon Rainey didn't invite me to give quite that message. Um, no, I'm very happy to take it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. You know, there's the uh, kind of usual risk allocation for um, a tie-in agreement when you're tying in uh, a, and I, you know, I don't want to be too specific, but, you know, in the context of long-term agreements, uh, tying in a, an upstream oil and gas field into, a, you know, a terminal, uh, usually you have a terminal operator and you have the upstream part, and as between the upstream parts, they would be in a JOA with a joint and several um, arrangements. And there's a sort of, there's the kind of the upstream world and this terminal world, and everyone uh, takes on cap liability for their spheres. Um, and if you introduce a more complex structure than that, with infrastructure and private equity and uh, single pots of money rather than unlimited <coughs> pockets, you necessarily complicate those spheres. Uh, which is fine because it uh, stretches the imagination and it encourages us to be creative. But if you skew that so that one party is capping their liability, you know, how does that pan out for everyone else? And as I say, I hope, well, <laughs> hopefully the contracts that we put in place will withstand that challenge. But that to me, that to me is the challenge of working opposite private equity. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So our next topic is sanctions, something that seems always to be with us, but irritatingly, just when one's got to grips with the various, usually fantastically complicated regimes which are in place and how they overlap, they then change.
new targets are added, Venezuela, for example. Old targets are removed, then they're put back in, and then they're blocked from being put back in, depending on where you are. A remarkably robust response from the EU to President Trump, you might think. We've got no one better to guide us through these shifting sands than our next speaker, Sue Miller, a partner here at Stevenson Harwood, with extensive commercial and banking litigation experience and co-head of Stevenson Harwood's Iran Group. Named as Woman Lawyer of the Year 2017 at the Law Society Excellence Awards, precisely for, in part, her contribution to supporting British Iranian banks in their efforts to reintegrate with the international banking community, and she was listed shortly afterwards in the Lawyers Hot 100, and she's got numerous plaudits in Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners. She's also got considerable experience uh, anybody here note this, it may, 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 may come in useful, of representing designated persons in challenge, challenging that designation before the EU courts. I should, before she starts, give a spoiler alert to anybody allergic to Brexit. There is a reference to Brexit on slide eight. You might want to avert your gaze. Thank you, Sue. I've only got a little time to address you on what is a very large subject and one which is, quite frankly, um, expanding exponentially. For the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on three main targets. Um, that's Russia, Iran and Venezuela. And I'm going to say a very few words on Brexit, because if and when we do Brexit, the regime affecting the UK will change. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to that. Okay, so at the EU level, starting with Russia, there are three main regulations in play. The first one, Regulation 208-2014, is in respect of misappropriations and human rights abuses in Ukraine. So that's probably less relevant to today's audience. That's basically asset freezers and travel bans, the types of sanctions that we're all very familiar with. <coughs> then we have Regulation 269-2014, and that's to do with sov Ukraine's sovereignty and its territorial integrity. Again, that's mainly asset freezers and travel bans. This is where it gets interesting. Regulation 833-2014, which has been amended three times and then it keeps, being expand it, it keeps being extended. This imposed the rather more novel sectoral sanctions. The sectorals, oh God, what have I done? He didn't get away with it. The sectoral sanctions restrict Russian access to capital markets. EU citizens, which term includes EU nationals, entities established in member states, and entities doing business in EU member states, which includes the airspace and vessels and aircraft registered in the, in the jurisdiction of the member states, are no longer allowed to lend money for a period exceeding 30 days to five major Russian state-owned banks, three oil companies, Rosneft, AK Transneft and Gazpromneft, and three arms manufacturers. They also impose an arms embargo and they heavily restrict cooperation with the Russian energy sector in that there is a ban of, on exports of innovative technology and ancillary services such as drilling and testing used by Russian companies to develop deep water, Arctic Circle and fracking. Other energy services require special approval. Now, that sounds really scary, but I've advised on sanctions for, well, since, two, since 2014, and I have never had to advise a client that they can't get in, involved in uh, a project in Russia. So they're actually quite narrow. So, prior to the 2nd of August 2017, there was broad trans transatlantic alignment. The US sanctions targeting Russia were very, very similar to the EU ones. There were some minor changes in, in parties, in named designations, but they were pretty much the same. That ended with the signing into the law of CATSA, which is the catchly named Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, targeting Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Now, the Russian section of the law has its own name, and it's called Countering Russian Influence in Europe and Eurasia Act of 2017. Now, it expands the scope of the US sanctions regime massively. Now, it's not yet fully enforced. It's, it's, it's not really enforced at all. But what, this is the real 
sting in the tail. Uh, President Trump hates these sanctions. He really does not want to bring them into force. But Congress has mandated him to do so. So he's going to have to do something, or they'll do it for him. It expands the existing restrictions on US persons quite significantly, but it also threatens secondary sanctions. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, di the difference, primary sanctions impact US persons. Secondary sanctions impact non-US persons. And basically what they're intended to do is to persuade you not to do business with the targeted regime. Now, I'm not a US lawyer, so this is not a US, you know, this is not a, a US law lecture, um, but this is my experience based on advising for five years. So, what's so scary about them? Okay, they include imposing a menu of sanctions on foreign persons who knowingly make significant investments and Significant investments is only $5 million, which I dare say you could get to quite quickly in any oil and gas investment. In special Russian crude oil projects, that's deep water, Arctic offshore, or fracking. The menu of sanctions which is referred to is really very significant and includes measures which are designed to exclude the alleged wrongdoer from participation in the US financial system and which are akin to being designated as an SDN and therefore subject to asset freezes. They also impose restrictions on US correspondent and payable through accounts. So if that's not scary enough, your bank is going to be really, really paying close attention because if they're, in, if they're affected by the sanctions, they could find their access to the US financial system cut off. They also impose blocking sanctions on foreign persons who knowingly materially violate US ma Russian sanctions or facilitate significant san sanctions, including deceptive or structured transactions on behalf of any person subject to Russian sanctions or their immediate family members. And then the final one is really blocking sanctions on the Russian government officials responsible for corruption in Russia or elsewhere or if you somehow are involved in doing business with them. So that, again, can be very, really very wide. Now, as you know, the Act also imposed a number of reporting obligations on the US Treasury, and that resulted in the so-called Putin's List. This ultimately led to the designation of Oleg Deripas Deripaska and others, although the sanctions against Mr Deripaska have been significantly watered down. As you will have read, that hasn't stopped him from suing the US for his designation. The secondary sanctions, as I said, are potentially very, very wide ranging, but they're not yet fully in force. As and when they are enacted, the devil will be in the detail. As I said before, President Trump does not like them, but his antipathy is not going to be the determining factor. Congress has mandate, mandated him to act and he's going to have to do so. Right, turning to Iran, sorry. I don't want to spend too much time going over the history, but it's set out there on the slide. So as, by way of reminder, uh, the five powers entered into the JCPOA on the 14th of July, 2015. It was implemented on the 16th of January, 2016. The idea was that there was sanctions relief was going to be put in place. Um, and everybody was going to be able to do business with Iran. It didn't quite work out like that. <coughs> What's important to appreciate is that the JCPOA did not impact US primary sanctions. So it was right the way through the process, it has remained pretty much prohibited for US per persons to do business in Iran, subject to a general license for US owned subsidiaries, non non-US subsidiaries of US companies. So, on the 8th of May, President Trump announced the withdrawal of the US from the JCPOA, and there was a phase withdrawal on the 6th of August and 4th of November. Now, the main one for our purposes is 
the rollback of sanctions on the 4th of November, which is really the prohibition on, <coughs> uh, on transactions involving oil and gas. Now, the US government has stated that non-US businesses and persons that conduct business in contravention of the secondary sanctions risk US enforcement action, which, depend, depending on the nature of the breach, again could result in a menu of, of, of um, penalties, and it'd be a maximum of five. We don't have time for me to go through them today. It's also quite boring, um, but they're really quite horrid. So most people try and avoid um, breaching US sanctions. So, as we've heard, the EU and the other signatories to the JCPOA were not particularly pleased with President Trump's um, position in relation to Iran. In relation to the EU, the Commission adopted a delegated act on the 6th of June 2018, and that was the um, amendment of the blocking regulation. The blocking regulation was put in place originally in 1996, when the US introduced secondary sanctions against Iran and Cuba. Now, the amended <coughs> excuse me, blocking regulation operates in four ways. It prohibits EU persons from complying, directly or indirectly, actively or by deliberate omission, with any of the secondary sanctions without authorization. Authorization will only be granted to the extent that non-compliance would seriously damage the EU person's interests. It prohibits the recognition of any non-EU judgment which gives effect to the, EU, to the US secondary sanctions. It enables parties who have been affected by third parties' decisions to comply with the US secondary sanctions to claim damages from those entities. And finally, it requires persons, EU persons affected directly or indirectly by the sanctions <coughs> to notify the Commission within 30 days. Um, I'm not altogether clear on why that's in place, but it is a very strict obligation. Now, <coughs> the blocking regulation is directly uh, enforceable in all of the member states, uh, but the member states themselves retain um, some independence in the way in which the blocking regulation is implemented, by which I mean the penalties for breaching the blocking regulation. In the UK, it's a criminal offence, but that's not the case throughout the other EU member states. So there are some member states, including I think Germany, where it's an administrative penalty, and there are some member states where there is no penalty for breaching the blocking regulation at all. So it's a, the blocking regulation is a completely imperfect tool. Um, I had to smile wryly when um, Simon said it was, a, it was kind of a bold move by the EU. I think it's a fig leaf. Just trying to say something good for the EU. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a fig leaf. But it does, it, it does place companies into a stark choice. They either have to decide that they're going to choose the US and they, want to they need to continue to do business with the US and so therefore everyone's going to get out of Iran, or comply with the, uh, in which case you, uh, you are, at least in the UK, um, potentially at risk of committing a criminal offence, unless you can find a reason, a good commercial reason why you have extricated yourself, or you comply with the EU blocking regulation and you could find yourselves subject to action in the US. So what's happened? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, most if not all international oil companies that had dipped a toe in the Iranian waters have decided to remove that toe. Venezuela. So, Venezuela has been in the sanctioned sites of the US for well over a decade. There was a very significant ramping up on the 28th of January 2019 
with the issue of the Executive Order 13857, which designated PDVSA. It includes all entities in which PDVSA owns directly or indirectly a 50% or greater interest, subject to there's some very limited relief for PDVSA's US subsidiaries, CITGO and P P PDV Holdings. Now, the des designation prohibits US persons from engaging in transactions with PDVSA unless they're unable to bring themselves within a very limited exception. All PDVSA <laughs> property in the US is blocked. Now, at this point in time, you might be thinking, well, that's fine. I'm not a US person. Why do I need to worry about this? As things stand, the designation does not appear to have extraterritorial effect. But many IOCs will be US persons or will consider that they're US persons in any event. In addition, now here's again the sting, the US government can impose sanctions on any person determined to have materially assisted, sponsored or provided financial material or technological support for or for goods or services in the support of any person whose property and interest in property are blocked pursuant to this order. Now, OFAC's current guidance suggests it's not intended to have extraterritorial effect. But Mr. Trump has had his officials visit um, neighbouring countries of Venezuela in the last week and said, well, it might have extraterritorial effect. So I wouldn't do business with PDVSA if I were you. And even more recently, um, Mr. Trump himself has stated that he may impose secondary sanctions on Venezuela. Well, <coughs> excuse me. The EU sanctions against Venezuela are far more limited in scope. They're pretty much limited to the traditional asset freezes and travel bans that we're all really very familiar with. Right, Brexit. Hold your nose, we'll get through it quickly. Now, the UK has traditionally been one of the um, firmest proponents of sanctions as a foreign policy tool, both at e UN and EU level. One can anticipate a similar approach as the UK, as and when the UK leaves the EU. That said, there has to be really very obvious questions about the UK's ability to impose effective sanctions independently of the EU and the US. The position pre-Brexit is that following the adoption of the common security policy by the Maastricht Treaty, the EU gives effect to UN sanctions and it imposes autonomous sanctions by EU-wide regulations. So we just follow the regulations that are imposed at EU level. As I've said, they've got direct effect and they apply to all EU citizens. If the EU leaves without a deal, which on one level looks more likely and on another level looks less likely, who knows? If the UK leaves without a deal, it's proposing to carry over all of the EU sanctions at the time of its departure. It's doing that by um, introducing regulations. Now, <laughs> this may or may not be um, a demonstration of the way that the UK has negotiated Brexit to date, but I can tell you that it has done a really terribly bad job of transposing the EU regulation into the UK. I have a client who will become a designated national um, the day after we fall out of the EU, even though it's, it will be protected by the EU regulation. Great. Now, the Act envisages a much wider scope to impose sanctions, uh, including in relation to human rights abuses, and that was introduced following the scribble poisonings. That in itself is a story because the government were really, really unkeen on Magnitsky-style sanctions until the scribble bomb of poisoning, at which point they, they had to be introduced. Um, other things that are interesting is that it extends the reporting obligations, i.e. 
there are extensive ex reporting obligations in the regulations. And the moment they pretty much apply to the financial regulated sector, and they've been there right the way through, and to a, a series of other people like accountants, lawyers, auctioneers, casinos, estate agents. Once we, we fall out of Brexit, fall out of the EU, uh, we will all have reporting obligations. And if you fail to report, it's a criminal offence. There's also, there's one, there is one bright message, and the bright message is, at the moment, we can only license in accordance with the EU regulations, and they are very small number of, of, of entitlements uh, and exemptions. There is a promise of general licenses, so that there is this, there's a, a, a flexibility which would enable the UK to issue a general license um, to support UK business. Um, however, none of the regulations that have been published to date include any such power. And I've been told my time's up. Thank you very much indeed. Now for some recent case law. Force majeure clauses come in all shapes and sizes, as we know, but I think one common feature is that when contracts are drafted, these clauses never seem to get the really important drafting attention they deserve. They seem to get slotted in based on some standard form which the one party has used in the past, which they've lifted from another party's body of terms, logic, BP, uh, totals, terms and conditions, and they just get slotted in. And when things go wrong, parties can have very unreal expectations about what the force majeure clause can actually do for you. And occasionally a hard case throws a harsh light on the inadequacies of that drafting process. Nowhere more so, I think, than the recent decision in Cedril, Ghana and Tullow, Ghana, which uh, is going to be spoken about next. Two difficult questions came up. One, concurrent causes. How does a force majeure clo clause cope with those? And secondly, reasonable endeavours to avoid the effects of force majeure, what is the actual practical scope of that obligation? One oddity which arises out of Cedril and Tullow is that whenever a hard force majeure case comes up, it seems it's Mr Justice Tier who decides it. He dealt with the crude sky in 2014, <coughs> Tullow in 2018, Classic and Lyon in 2018, going to the Court of Appeal quadrant case uh, uh, with me and Andrew Leung in July. Mr Justice Tier was appealed twice, not, I think, is being appealed in Cedril and Tullow. So it's definitely his special subject for mastermind. Gemma Morgan of Quadrant uh, was junior counsel for the successful claimant Cedril. Gemma is a junior in very hot demand. The Legal Week billed her as the new star at the bar in 2016. And the star, I think, gets brighter and brighter. The quotes from the, the directories are their usual embarrassing selves. Razor sharp mind, ideally suited to complex commercial disputes one particularly which I like here, a combination of intellect, enthusiasm and emotional empathy mark her out as someone special. Having had the pleasure and privilege of leading her in some big energy cases over the past few years, I can endorse all of that. And I think any leader in chambers can also endorse this comment, can easily hold her own against QCs. You bet she can. So Gemma, did Mr Justice Tier actually get it right this time? Uh, yes, but perhaps for the wrong reasons. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Simon, for that kind introduction. Now, the background to this case was the very hot market for deep water rigs and drill ships back in 2011 and 2012, and the bottom that subsequently fell out of that market following the oil price crash in 2014. Oil companies which had previously scrambled to lock in long-term rig contracts suddenly found themselves looking for ways out um, of their onerous obligations. Now, Tullow, the defendant in this case, was one of those companies. Tullow held two concessions offshore Ghana together with its JV partners. The two relevant fields for our purposes, and bear with me because the detail does matter, um, were Ten to the west and Jubilee to the east, and Tullow was operator of both. Uh, and whilst you're looking at that slide, note the white dashed line, which is the boundary between uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana. In 2013, the JV got permission to develop 10, and first oil was expected there in mid-2016. The Jubilee field was already on stream, 
but as a condition of granting permission to drill, the government of Ghana required the JV to develop a wider area known as the Greater Jubilee Full Field. So in light of these, um, these expected commitments, Tullo hired the West Leo, an ultra-deep water semi-submersible from Sea Drill, initially for one year, but given that the rates were shooting up, uh, they locked it in until June 2018. The contract area was Ghana, and the day rate was a whopping 600,000 a day. Tullo's intentions, which formed a, a large part of the, the case at trial, um, were found to be as follows. Until Q3 2016, Tullo planned to use the West Leo for completions in 10, and then move it in 20, late 2016 to Greater Jubilee. Now, unfortunately for Tullo, a number of spanners appeared in the works. First, and probably the big one, in mid-2014, oil price crashed, which heralded an era of low oil prices. Secondly, Ghana referred an offshore boundary dispute with the Côte d'Ivoire to ITLOS, International Tribunal on Law of the Sea, in April 2015. Um, ITLOS then issued an order requiring Ghana to prevent new drilling in the disputed boundary region. The disputed boundary region included the Ten Field. Now, because it only prevented new drilling and not completions on wells that had already been drilled, the practical effect of the ITLOS order was to prevent Tullo from drilling just one well in ten that it otherwise would have done. And it had no effect on drilling in Greater Jubilee. <coughs> Third problem was that in December 2015, the government of Ghana rejected Tullo's plan of development for Greater Jubilee. The practical effect? No drilling there for the time being. Uh, and finally, in February 2016, the FPSO used by the Jubilee field suffered a turret-bearing failure, uh, limiting offtake and therefore production. So, by Q3 2016, there was no more drilling to be done in 10. Tullow did not have permission to start Greater Jubilee drilling, and it was paying $600,000 a day for the West Leo in, in circumstances where the market rate uh, was about 150000 Unsurprisingly, and especially given the low oil price, um, Tullow wanted out of the West Leo contract. Uh, they needed a plan, and in what probably seemed a very good idea at the time, they called their plan Project Voldemort, <laughs> which, as you can imagine, led to some interesting specific disclosure requests. <laughs> so Voldemort involved declaring force majeure in October 2016 and terminating the West Leo. The basis was said to be that the it loss order was a drilling moratorium, a force majeure event under the contract, and prevented Tullow from fulfilling its obligations. Siegel unsurprisingly rejected the declaration. It bought a claim for $275 million based upon what Tullow would have had to pay had it terminated for convenience using the clause that allowed it to do that in the contract. Now, as Simon alluded to, this was a quite a typical force majeure clause. There were defined force majeure events, the usual type, the party seeking to rely upon force majeure must not have caused the force majeure event, and the force majeure event had to have causative effect in that it hindered or delayed or prevented performance. There were notice provisions which had to be complied with, which I think Chris will speak about shortly. The party seeking to rely upon the force majeure clause had to use reasonable endeavours to try to overcome the force majeure event. Um, quite what that meant um, was, a, was a subject of quite a lot of debate, and I'll come on and, and look at a little bit of that um, shortly. Um, and then if the force majeure event continued for 60 days, then, as is quite common, one party could terminate. So there were many issues, but the two that I want to, want to look at uh, are these. In circumstances where the court found that the it loss order did constitute a drilling moratorium within the meaning of the contract, that left two key issues. Firstly, did the moratorium prevent Tullow from fulfilling a term of the contract? And secondly, if it did, did Tullow use reasonable endeavours to avoid its effects? Now, the judge assumed, but did not actually find, that it was a term of the contract that Tullow was required to issue a drilling programme and was prevented from doing so in October 2016. In its notices to Cedral at the time, Tullow had said that both the ITLOS order and the government of Ghana rejecting its Greater Jubilee Development Plan prevented it from drilling. 
but by the time of the trial, its case was that it was only the ITLOS order which had causative effect. Cedril's case was that drilling was prevented only by the government rejection and not by the ITLOS order. But alternatively, if the moratorium was also a cause, it was one of two effective causes. And in order to bite, the force majeure event had to be the sole effective cause under the contract. Uh, the judge gave a helpful reminder of the correct approach to questions of causation. They are sensitive to the legal context and to be resolved by reference to common sense. Applying that nicely stated test, he found that both the it loss order and the lack of, lack of approval for greater jubilee were effective causes of the inability to drill. So the key question was then whether there are two causes of an inability to perform, one a force majeure event and one not, can the party rely upon the force majeure exception to excuse performance? The judge treated this as a question of construction and he found that clause 27, which is there, the relevant part, he found that clause 27 required the effective cause of the failure to perform to be a force majeure event. He then went on to find on the facts that Tullow was not prevented from drilling in Greater Jubilee in October 2016 by the ITLOS order, but by the lack of government approval to drill. And therefore, he said, the causation requirement of Clause 27 was not satisfied. Now, that's fine, except earlier the judge had found that there were two effective causes of Tullow being unable to provide drilling instructions, the ITLOS order, and the lack of government approval. So his conclusion was internally consistent, though I would say no doubt the outcome was correct. In my view, uh, the better approach, which was consistent with previous Court of Appeal authority and principle, uh, would have been to say that force majeure is an exception to excuse performance and therefore has to be construed narrowly. As a matter of law, where there are two effective causes of non-performance, one force majeure and one not, Absent clear wording in the contract to the contrary, force majeure should not be available. Because if the force majeure event occurs in isolation, performance is still possible, so it ought not to be excused. But unfortunately, that's not the way in which the judge treated it um, in the judgment. The judge went on to consider if he was wrong on force majeure, whether Tullow had exercised reasonable endeavours to overcome uh, the force majeure. Now, Tullow had permission to do workovers or completions on a handful of wells in the contract area that weren't uh, affected by the moratorium and weren't affected by the fact that there was no drilling uh, in Greater Jubilee. But Tullow argued that it was not in its commercial interests to do any of that work in October 2016. There was no business case for it, is the way that it was put. Cedril argued that Tullow's commercial interests were not relevant at all uh, as a matter of construction of the clause, uh, but the judge disagreed. The judge said that Tullow's commercial interests could be relevant, but it depended on the context. The relevant context here was the desire of one party to declare force majeure in a long-term rig hire contract in order to excuse performance. And he, he said that if Tullow chose not to do the available drilling because it was less profitable than the drilling which would have been done but was now prohibited by the moratorium, Tullow couldn't then say that the cause of its failure to drill was the moratorium. The cause of the failure to drill was its choice not to do, not to do the work because it didn't think it was profitable. And so in this context specifically, greater expense, the judge said, cannot be relied upon as a good reason not to do the work. There we go. On the facts, the judge found that Tullow could and should have instructed Cedril to drill two workovers at an, and to complete two other wells. And obviously the facts um, of the case were quite important there in terms of what the um, wells were, um, what, what was required to be done with the wells. One piece of evidence that went against Tullow in respect of every single one of the wells which the judge found should have been done um, was the fact that they had tried to make the business case to their JV partners 
that the wells ought to have been done. And they looked for JV approval to do them. When JV approval wasn't forthcoming, then they said, well, we're not doing it. So obviously, the arguments which their own people had made to the JV partners as to why the work ought to have been done uh, rather undermined their case at trial that there was no business case for doing that work. Importantly, I think for future cases, the judge did not find that all of the available work had to be done because to do some of it, he said, would have been futile. So that rather leaves um, questions open for the future um, as to what futile work uh, might mean. So what to take away? Um, when drafting, given that the judge held that the causation requirement is a question of construction, um, I would suggest making express that force majeure only bites in the event that it is the sole cause preventing performance. When listing potential force majeure events, give thought to the specific circumstances of the contract rather than rehearsing just the usual list of suspects. So where an area has particular risks, for example a boundary dispute as here, you might try to negotiate the inclusion of those which could threaten performance. Similarly, if one party ought properly bear a risk, such as, for example, failure to obtain drilling approval from a government, include it in a list of things which do not constitute force majeure. And also, be specific about whether the event is required to affect the entire contra contract area or not. So in this case, the fact that the ITLOS order did not cover the whole contract area provoked a lot of debate about whether it was a drilling moratorium within the meaning of the contract at all. When declaring force majeure, if you think you may have a potential force majeure situation, be realistic about what is really preventing performance. We're looking at a, for a broad common sense approach. Remember that only a sole effective cause is likely to get you home. A and think about what's actually happening on the ground. So Tullow's legal team really had their work cut out at trial trying to argue that the it loss order had affected Tullow's plans um, when their own internal correspondence at the time was infused with delight. The fact the it loss order didn't really muck up their plans at all. Um, pay attention to your force majeure notice and correspondence in which you are thinking about um, declaring force majeure. Again, at the time, the force majeure notices alleged multiple uh, causes which they said prevented drilling in late 2016. So again, it was very hard to persuade the judge later at trial that only the it loss order was causative. And finally, if you do have a reasonable endeavours clause, whilst the economics of the available work is not irrelevant, I think this decision says that there is a high hurdle uh, to avoid doing available work and you have a duty to consider your counterparty's interests in receiving performance. And certainly lack of profitability is not a good reason for not doing work. There has to be something more. You have to be in the futile territory. Um, but no doubt that's a, that's a word that can be argued over by lawyers in due course. That is an excellent question. And because I knew I was <laughs> going to be guillotined at 12 minutes, I, I left out a, a good spiel about what exactly was the obligation. So that's why I said the judge um, assumed that the obligation was to uh, provide a, a drilling programme. So there were two matters which were relied upon by Tullow. One was uh, the obligation to provide a drilling programme, and the second was to provide ingress and egress from the drilling site. And um, in opening submissions, the argument was made that they couldn't do those things if um, they weren't allowed to drill. Cedral made the point, well, there's nothing stopping you from issuing a drilling programme. That hasn't been prohibited. Um, so in my view, the case ought to have stopped there because there was no prevention of performance. The question was not, can Tullow drill? Can Tullow do work? Is there work available? That simply wasn't the question because strictly, um, they had no obligation to fulfil, and that's precisely why um, the contract has provisions in it for a standby rate and for termination for convenience, because if there is no work to be done, then certain, certain matters follow. So, um, yes, I, I didn't really understand what the, what the obligation that was prevented either, but if the judge had stopped there, then we wouldn't have the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the case. So you didn't ask for a preliminary issue then? Certainly not. I came to the case late, Simon. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Gemma.
Our last topic is the VEX question of giving notice under contractual notice provisions in oil and gas contracts and making that notice stick. And it's another good example, I think, of bad oil and gas drafting uh, uh, and a, dra a drafter simply taking a notice clause off a shelf without thinking, why am I using it? What do I intend to happen if notice is not given? What do I intend to happen if notice is not given in time or quite in the form I am prescribing? And it's a question which only ever seems to come up when it's all gone terribly wrong and a party often in desperation falls back on saying, you didn't give notice. Well, there'll be no excuses for not getting the drafting right in future after our last speaker, Chris Smith, QC of Quadrant. Until this year, he was another stellar junior uh, at Quadrant. Uh, I quote again, tenacious and effective advocate. Good quote this, exactly the man you want in a tight situation. This perhaps, rather more mixed, ability to absorb immense amounts of information. Uh, again, I've had the privilege and pleasure of leading uh, Chris on many occasions, and I can echo all of those. The last comment in, in Legal 500 last year was the equal of silks on the other side. Well, that was pretty prescient because Chris took silk this year, a great loss to leaders in chambers. You, I, I referred to an ability to absorb immense amount of information. You will have seen on your handout there's a vast number of PowerPoint slides. So the, the fun part of this talk will be watching him do 17 slides in 12 minutes. Chris, on your marks, get set, go. Thank you, Simon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, without further ado, I will get on to the meat of the talk, considering some notification regimes, what they entail uh, and what their effect is. Uh, as Simon says, these are frequently used in the oil and gas industry. Perhaps the best example is the logic standard offshore terms. Uh, their force majeure provision is broken up into several parts. Clause 15.1, that is the main meat of the provision, uh, providing that uh, parties will not be responsible for failure to fulfil in the event of a force majeure event. Notice the words in red that, always, that introduces the proviso that the event has to have been notified in accordance with this clause 15. 15.3 itself is the notification provision and that provides that the party seeking to rely on the event shall notify the other party without delay. Uh, this is a standard uh, set of conditions which is in wide use and as we will come on to see at the end of the talk in the Tullow case itself a variation on this clause within that used in their contract. Shell's upstream purchase order standard terms and conditions again uh, has a notification provision uh, to similar effect maybe again we'll come and see if that's right if it is to similar effect and that provides that the obligation to give notice is one that sh is to be performed without delay. One of the cases we're going to come on to consider, uh, the Scottish Power and BP Exploration Operating Company. Uh, it was a contract, long-term contract for the supply by BP uh, of natural gas. Uh, whilst the judgment doesn't expressly say as much, it's fair supposition to think that the uh, terms in place were BP's standard gas supply terms. The notification provision in that case was uh, somewhat complex. That provided, firstly, within 10 days, notification was to be given of the relevant event. Then another five days after that notification, an interim report was to be provided. And then in two, within 20 days of the initial notification, if requested, a detailed report then had to be provided. And we'll come on to see in a little bit what the effect of that provision was. Now, obviously, uh, in most cases, the issue that the court is having to consider is what is the effect of notice not being given? If notice hasn't been given, does that preclude the party seeking to rely on the force majeure event from doing so? The guiding principle was laid down in Bremer Handel Gesellschaft. Uh, Firstly, and perhaps somewhat obviously, it said it depends on the form of the clause itself, the relation of the clause to the contract as a whole, and general considerations of law. Slightly more concrete guidance was given also in that case, though. One of the key points was said, well, does the clause make it absolutely clear what has to be done to comply with the notification provision? And one of the observations in this regard is that, well, if it was to be construed as a condition precedent, the court thought the clause 
ought to have specified the exact time within which notice had to be served. Let's see how the principle has been applied down the years. Uh, we'll start with Mamadoyle, a 2003 case. Uh, this was a case where uh, the claimant uh, had a contract where the defendant agreed it would allow it to manipulate its non-heat crude and give it a right of first refusal to supply crude oil to the defendant. Uh, the defendant breached those obligations uh, and it sought to rely on an event of force majeure. The clause in question required prompt notice of the force majeure event. Held, albeit obiter, uh, compliance with the notification provision was a condition precedent. The reasons given for this. Firstly, the wording of the clause was imperative. It said that prompt notice shall be given. Secondly, standing back and looking at the purpose of the clause, it must have been to allow the alleged force majeure event to be investigated contemporaneously by the other party. Uh, and if notification was not a condition precedent, the court was of the view that that object would be very largely defeated. Thirdly, it was said it was difficult to see what other purpose the clause might serve. A failure to give notice would be unlikely to, uh, to cause the other party significant losses, other than the losses which he had suffered as a result of the non-performance. So then again, it was held that the commercial purpose of the clause must have been to constrain the party who hasn't given notice from relying on the event at all. So for the first case we're looking at, notice is a condition precedent, but then there was a wave of decisions in which a contrary conclusion was reached. The azure gas. This case, the relevant clause required the party seeking to invoke force majeure so that it shall immediately notify the other party. Held, not a condition precedent. The first point was that whilst the word shall was used, at the same time, the clause easily could have said that notice was a condition precedent or made it clear by implication that was intended in effect, but it didn't do so. Secondly, the court thought it was difficult to accept that the parties thought that a failure to give notice immediately and the failure in that notice to give all possible details as to the expected duration of the force majeure event should disentitle the affected party wholly from reliance on that event. Just thought that that seemed to be making a mountain out of a molehill. Next case in the wave of non-condition precedent cases, the Crude Sky, Great Elephant Corporation. This is one of Nigel Tears' cases. As Simon said, Nigel Tears had to deal with a lot of these cases. Clause in question required notification of the event immediately on the occurrence of force majeure. And the notice had to include the measures that were being adopted to minimise the effect of the event. Held not a condition precedent. Again, the absence of clear wording to this effect uh, was deemed very significant, notwithstanding the imperative wording of shall that was used in the clause. Secondly, the clause required notice to be given immediately rather than in a fixed number of days. So going back to the point that was made by the House of Lords in the Bremer case, it was held, well, it's difficult then to identify if a notice is or is not compliant with a contractual regime. Thirdly, the fact that the notice in question had to give details of the measures that were going to be taken to minimise the event necessarily suggested that there was going to be some delay in the notice being given. Obviously, a party who wishes to rely on the event isn't going to know what measures it needs to take to mitigate against it immediately on learning of the event. So the clause envisaged there was going to be some delay before the notice was given, and it was thought that that militated against the suggestion that the clause was a condition precedent. Next case we're going to consider, 2015, Scottish Power. We looked at the clause earlier on and we could see that there was definite time limits and a staggering of them. Again, 10 days for the notice, provision of an interim report within a further five days, provision of a detailed report if requested 20 days after the initial notification. Held, again, not a condition precedent. Continuing the theme of the last two cases, the first reason given for this is there's no wording to that effect. Uh, when the Mamador point was put to the judge, Mr Justice Leggett, and it was said, well, shall seems pretty clear wording in that regard, 
Mr Justice Leggett wasn't impressed with that point. He said, well, no, shall just merely indicates that it's a contractual obligation. Just says that they have to do it, fine, but it doesn't tell you what the consequences of not giving the notice are. So he wasn't particularly impressed with that point. The next point that was put by the party seeking to rely was, OK, well, we get around with this clause the problem of there not being any fixed time. You've got 10 days, 5 days, 20 days. So in accordance with Bremer, it's very clear what the party required to give a notice has to do. Mr Justice Leggett thought that was good enough. He said, well, notwithstanding the fact that you do actually have fixed time limits there, there is still considerable room for uncertainty within the clause as to whether or not it had been complied with. Now, this argument required a degree of ingenuity from the judge and probably counsel involved uh, to work out, well, what type of ambiguity can we identify in the clause? The best example that was given by the judge was the detailed report has to be provided 20 days after notification if requested. But there's no time limit for when any request can be made. So what if the request was made 19 days after the notification? Does that mean they had to provide a detailed report within one day? Well, that seems terribly unclear. Ergo, notwithstanding this very carefully staggered set of provisions with exact timings, it was held that there was too much uncertainty and that meant it unlikely that the parties would have wanted this to be a condition precedent because of all the arguments there might be about whether a notice had complied or not. Thirdly, and getting into quite small text, uh, the judge considered the point that he thought was the most formidable one in favour of saying that the clause was a condition precedent. Namely, can it really be right that the parties intended a failure to give notice to sound in damages. And the judge says that this was a good point. But he also said that he thought the point cut both ways. If substantial damages have been suffered as a result of the failure to give notice, well, that's your remedy. You've got substantial damages. On the other hand, if the other party can't point to any significant damages that it's incurred as a result of the failure to give notice, well, that indicates the breach is pretty minor. And if the breach is pretty minor, it seems inherently unlikely that the parties intended a very valuable contractual right to be lost as a result thereof. So as a result, uh, Mr Justice Leggett was ultimately not moved by the damages point. Audience participation. So to bring us to the end uh, and to Gemma's case, uh, Gemma is going to be asked for this point to keep a poker face, not to give away the answer. So in the Cedril and Tullow case, uh, the force majeure provision was as we see on the screens before us. So you can see in 27.1 makes it clear that the force majeure event is one which has been notified in accordance with this clause 27. And in 27.5 it says uh, that the party seeking to rely on the event shall notify the other party without delay. Let's have a show of hands please. Who thinks that the court held that this was a condition precedent provision. <laughs> okay, uh, just to see who actually is still awake or waiting for their wine. <laughs> who thinks the court held that it was not a condition precedent clause? Bearing in mind Nigel Tier was the judge and we've seen how he's treated these clauses, you'd be fair for thinking that he would have decided that this was not a condition precedent clause. Held. A condition precedent clause. Um, uh, it, this was obiter, but the judge held that it was a condition precedent largely because uh, you will see, going back a page, at the end of 27.1 there is a provision that the party shall use reasonable endeavours to mitigate, avoid, circumvent or overcome the circumstances of force majeure. And that was repeated elsewhere in clause 27. Uh, and the judge was of the view uh, that uh, because it's only if notice is given that the duty to mitigate arises, that in itself shows that provision of a notice was a condition precedent to reliance upon the clause. So in the standard form of talks of this, what lessons can we learn for this? Imperative language may or may not be sufficient. Identification of a fixed period of time for compliance may or may not be sufficient. The only lesson we can say with any degree of certainty is that if you want your notification provision to constitute a condition precedent, use those exact words. Uh, that has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but it's very difficult to compete against wine and canapes. Thank you very much.
The test for how force majeure provisions interplay with the doctrine of frustration is this. Does the clause in question fully and completely provide for the event in question? Uh, now, that's easy to say, but it's not always easy to work out whether or not full and complete provision uh, has been provided on the clause. What I would say is this, though, in the context of notification provisions. If the parties are arguing about a notification provision, normally that means it's got to the point where it is a force majeure event, the relevant event within the meaning of the clause itself. That means that actually provision has been made for it. And if the only argument is, well, they've not given notice, it's not open to the other side to say, oh, well, that's not full and complete provision, because all they're saying is actually, please let us off the hook for not complying with our requirement. So I think if it really came down to it, the, the position of the courts would be for a party who hadn't provided with the notice in a clause that was a condition precedent, they couldn't then fall back on the common law doctrine of frustration. Not precisely in that, but if you go back to the beginning, excuse me, so as I said, it's based on the logic conditions. So you might think, ah, okay, if I come in front of Mr. Justice Tier and I've got the logic conditions in my contract, that means it's going to be held to be a condition precedent. But the one point I would draw to your attention in the log logic conditions is that actually, and this was the alteration that was made, uh, you don't have the common duty to mitigate at the end of clause 15.1. That had been added by the parties to Tullow, and as we've seen, Nigel Tier thought that was significant in construing the clause. So to answer your question, no, the other cases I've considered don't. However, because lots of contracts are based on the logic conditions, there will be plenty of other contracts out there which have the same form of wording, but perhaps with variants thereon, uh, as there was in Gemma's Tullow case. Right, well, can I ask you all to fill out your appraisal forms? It's not a condition of getting a drink, but it might help. Uh, and can I ask you to put your hands together and thank our panel for a wonderful evening? Thank you very much.